wait. Hey, everybody. Until they come. Up in the live, you're going to start seeing the views. Oh, okay. And then you'll start seeing things scrolling at the bottom. Okay. Hey, Eli. Whoever whoever's on, just start uh, typing in. Let's see who's all getting on. I thought we'd start a little bit early. Yeah. Just so that people can start acclimating. And a lot of people haven't done this before, so. Hey. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> you should see our room looks a little bit different right now. We move furniture around and different things. Hey, Monica. Mwah. Any word yet? I've been praying all day, today, on and off. Uh, and hey, hey Tracy. Tracy! Glad you could join us tonight. Welcome to our home. <laughs> Who else is on? There's four people. Five. <laughs> Who else is on? Hey, Becky. Hey, Becky. Good to see you. Well, see you. <laughs> Good for you to see us. Is John watching? <laughs> hey, Aaron. <laughs> Hi, Shelly. We're the greeters tonight. Yeah. Hey, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Good to see you. Hope you got some crackers and juice with you. <laughs> We're just hanging out, waiting for uh, uh, people to show. So we thought we'd start a little bit early. So let's see some hearts. <laughs> oh, I saw some. We've got some likes going on. Oh. Hey. hey, John. Hi, Connie. Oh, orange, okay. Orange juice That'll is work. good. Hey, Fran. Is Dick with you? <laughs> I think he's gonna. He'd enjoy this tonight. Oh, we got a heart. That's cool. <laughs> They're so tiny, it's hard to tell whose heart is whose. Yeah. We, we'll just trust that it's from all of you. Hi, Denise. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Hi Bonnie. Bonnie. Hey, Mark. Hi, kids. We are just hanging out here for a couple minutes, and then we're going to get started. Hi, hey. Denny. Hi, Denny. Hi, Mary. Hi, Hi Jody. Jody. Oh, this is... Oh, good. Well, hi, Dick. Hi, Dick. Awesome. <laughs> oh, we love you, too. Yes. This is great, huh? Well, this is my face, first Facebook Live, so... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Keep the love coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's encouraging. Words of affirmation. Yeah, that's my love language. <laughs> Now we got about one more minute before we really get started. Cool. Somebody cool. make sure you check in with Carolyn because she she wasn't sure how to do this, so we want to make sure she's on too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Who else is on? Just say hi. Yeah. It's nice to be connected, everybody. I, over by us, I don't know if you guys saw it, but the sun peaked out. For about five minutes that was wonderful yes I think we might see a little bit more of that hopefully yeah before it goes down hey Marilyn hey Marilyn Chris you're probably there too yeah <laughs> <clears throat> that's cool mining yay hey mining family chewy you got Madison on your lap <laughs> uh, aww. Yeah, go ahead, say hi to each other. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's family time. Uh, same here. We miss all you guys, too. Yeah. Well, Tanisha, <laughs> thanks for joining us. <laughs> hey, Patrick. Good to have you. And probably Olivia. Yeah, and Olivia, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rick. Good oh, to see you. I hope Donna can get on. Yeah, we're sending our love to Donna. 
Oh, it's good to be together. We really miss you guys. I, this is hard. <laughs> well, I think we can probably get started. It's uh, 7 mm -hmm. o'clock, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, you guys ready to go? Get the thumbs up. <laughs> There's, is there a thumbs up icon? <laughs> there probably is. <clears throat> Oh, there she hey, is. Hey, Carolyn. Glad you Hi, guys Dennis. Made it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Monica saying hi to Tanisha. Uh, nice. Look at all those lights. Yay. Awesome. Yay. They're ready to go. Okay. Well, hey, we're going to just start out with prayer, you guys, and then I'll we're going to talk about what we're doing and you know why we're doing it. So let's agree in prayer. Father, it's great that our, our, just our church family, our friends can be together tonight. God, everybody who will be watching this in the future, we're, we're just so grateful for the body of Christ. We're so grateful for relationships. We're so thankful uh, for your creation. Mm -hmm. Lord, we just thank you for this evening. It's a special night. It's a special night that we can be together. It's a special night all over the world tonight. Families are, are together. And so, God, we just pray that as we study your word, you would speak to us through it, that you would um, minister some deep things to us by uh, your spirit, and that we could come away better and different than when we uh, first sat down at the table together tonight. Yes. God, we love you this evening, and we just count it a privilege to be with all of our uh, friends and our, our family and extended family that are watching this, and we receive that in the name of Jesus. Amen. amen. And amen. Hey, and also, if you've got like a, a share. Hey, Josh. <laughs> if you have a, oh, hi, Megan. Hey, hey. Megan. <laughs> um, if you have a share and you want to share it, go for it, and we'll see if anybody else. I think it's a really important time to do communion with Passover. It's just an amazing opportunity, so I'm glad you all are tuned in and let's let other people know so they can do it as well. Yeah, the other thing too, you guys, um, <clears throat> this this is going to be a study, kind of an interactive study. And then if you have questions, um, we're going to take a little bit of time afterwards and answer some questions. So um, first of all, kind of the official greeting is Hag Sameach. Hag Sameach. Yeah, in, in Hebrew. In fact, Michelle and I <laughs> said that to each other this morning. I didn't expect that. It was so funny. But it, it just means like um, like happy holiday. Uh, it's it's a normal greeting at this time. So Passover really is is a celebration of freedom. It's a celebration of uh, a really a setting free historically, and that's kind of the way I want to break this study down. We're going to look at uh, Passover uh, historically. Then we're going to look at what Passover meant to uh, Jesus as the Messiah. And then we're going to finish up and talk about what Passover means in 2020 and how Passover is tying in with the whole COVID-19 virus that we're uh, all experiencing right now. So tonight, everybody all over the world, um, Jewish people, they're eating the Passover meal as a memorial as to what happened to them uh, in Egypt in terms of getting set free. So I want to kind of set the, the table that way for you to envision uh, families, Jewish families, all over the world, celebrating the oldest religious celebration on earth to date. The centerpiece of that entire meal is the remembrance of um, being set free from Egypt. And the lamb is really at, at the center of all that. Later on, we're going to pray that the revelation of the lamb comes into every Jewish home tonight as, mm -hmm. as families celebrate that. Yes. So yes. Passover really historically, again, uh, was, was a matter of life and death. Mm -hmm. It was a matter of um, death being required so that people could have life. And for those of us that remember the story, the, the 10 plagues were sent to break the nation of Egypt. The 10 plagues were actually a judgment on the gods of Egypt. And you can follow that through in Exodus and see how God systematically took down every god and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of the true God, whose name was Yahweh. 
So I'm going to read to you out of um, Scripture, and if you got your Bibles, I want to encourage you to follow along. I'm in Exodus chapter 12, and I'll begin reading in verses 1 and 2. It says this, While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. Now, have you ever wondered why God would choose a people and then he would literally um, incarcerate them in Egypt for 430 years? And the answer is really quite simple. It's because he needed to preserve this people and have them grow into a nation. Mm -hmm. When they came to uh, Egypt originally, uh, Jacob came to Egypt, there were only about 70 of them. And in the world at that time, it was extremely hostile. Outside of uh, the edges of civil civilization, there was a lot of tribal fighting. So if, if this tiny, fledgling little nation would have been left outside of Egypt, um, it probably would have gotten wiped off the map. But what God did is he hid Israel within the greatest empire in the world at that time, and literally protected them and sheltered them from everybody around them so that this nation could grow. There would be uh, like um, no, casual, no war casualties, literally. Mm. So that's why the nation multiplied so quickly and grew so strong so fast that within just a few generations, it was a real threat to the Egyptian empire. At least that's the way the Pharaoh thought. But that's why God put them in slavery. People always wondered, why, why would God enslave his people? What he was really doing, he was just protecting them so that in the time that he would bring them out, they would have become a mighty nation and, and could grow. So God gave these instructions um, to Moses and Aaron, his brother Aaron. And in verse 2 of Exodus 12, we read, From now on, this month will be the first month of, of the year for you. So God was resetting the calendar for Israel. If you want to greet somebody right now, another way besides Hag Sameach because of the holiday is Shana Tova. So try saying that with me. Shana, Shana, Shana Tova. Tova. And that means a good year to you. Ah, that's nice. Yeah. So, and, and literally, uh, you know, during the, the holidays, one of the expressions is, may your name be inscribed in the book of life for a good year. Mm. So a shortened way of saying that is Shana Tova, um, good, good year to you. Continuing on in Exodus uh, chapter 12, hey Matthew, it's good to see you. Continuing in Exodus um, chapter 12 verse 3, we read, speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th of this month, Every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. So now God is connecting this idea of taking a lamb, which was considered a sacred animal in Egypt, and connecting it to a household. And then he says in verse 4, And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighborhood next to his house, take it according to the number of persons, according to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Now we're going to find out why uh, they had to have enough people to um, quantify how many lambs that they have. And then in verse 5, it's very interesting, he says, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Mm -hmm. So God through Moses is instructing is all of Israel to em embrace a lamb, okay? And then not to just embrace any lamb, to embrace their lamb for their household. And that's a really, really important thing. Continuing on in Exodus 12, verse 6, he says, Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. So literally, twilight was right at sundown, and in the Jewish calendar, sundown is the beginning of the next day. So on the 10th, the 11th, the 12th, the 13th, and the 14th of 
this first month called the month of Nisan, they were going to be inspecting this lamb. They would have their lamb, they would tie the lamb outside the home, and every day they'd be inspecting the lamb for spots mm. and blemishes, and if it didn't pass, then they would have to find one because they needed one without any kind of spots or blemishes on it. Now, what's interesting, here we are on uh, April 8th. Uh, this is the night of Passover. And every Passover on this 14th day, there is a new or uh, a full moon, excuse me. So hopefully tonight, um, we've got a lot of clouds out there, but I don't know if you've noticed the last few nights, it's been really super bright. It's because the moon has been working its way up into being a full moon. And tonight the moon will be full as it is on every single Passover. And that's how God marks these days, the Jewish people, they are on a lunar calendar rather than a solar calendar like we are. Okay. So it's, it's just different. And uh, they do things to keep that calendar in sync. But they do that. And the reason they do that, and it's very interesting, if you read in the book of Revelation, it says someday the sun is going to be done away with, mm -hmm. but the moon is going to last forever. Wow. So the moon is always this, this mark of time for God that in this special time where he's, he's bringing about all his feasts, we've got this full moon, wow. and tonight's the night. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 7, then we read, and they shall take some of the blood, so they're going to kill this lamb, and, and this was very difficult. The family had to stand around, and watch as the father slit the throat mm -hmm. of this little lamb. Now, try to, just try to imagine this for a minute. You've had a lamb in your house now for five days, right? And uh, if you've got kids around you, you know how that gets. You suddenly, you know, they probably named it. Right. Which is the worst thing to do because now it's starting to become a pet. Right. But this lamb was always destined for slaughter. Mm -hmm. And so the whole family had to watch as the, the father in the house cut the throat of the lamb and then took some of the blood. And in verse 7, he put it on the two doorposts, so on each side of the door, and then across the top, the lintel. And that was going to be a sign. We read, he put it on the doorposts and the lintel of the houses where they ate it. Verse 8, then they shall eat the flesh, or they're going to eat the roasted lamb, that night with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Mm -hmm. Now unleavened bread um, in scripture leaven stands for sin and so without any leaven that means that the sin is removed mm -hmm. and all week now starting tonight Jewish households go on with no leaven in the house Okay. And as I recall, before this night, the Jewish women and mothers were cleaning their house, making sure there was no leaven in it right. by the time they got to tonight. In fact, why don't you share about the ceremonial feather in the dustpan? Oh, I don't know if I remember that, actually. Well, on, on the final night, the final cleansing, oh. the, after the woman, this is typical. Um, by the way, Hope Goodson, I'm so glad that you're watching. <laughs> I can't wait to get to see you guys again, but anyhow, I don't want to get distracted. So on the final night, because the woman has to do, she does all the work, she finds one little crumb of yeast left in the house, a little bit of leaven, and she's got a dustpan, and she hands the husband the feather, and then she holds the dustpan, and the husband sweeps that last, one last crumb of yeast, <laughs> the last little bit of sin. That's gracious. Yes, out of, the, out of the house. Isn't that typical? The women do all the work and then the men get the credit at the end. So literally that means that the house has no leaven. Now, when I lived in Israel, that whole week was terrible. There was no good bread, no good pastries, um, no, no bagels. It was just plain. You, I mean, it was just awful. It was because just, did we say leaven is yeast, so you can't rise anything without the yeast. Right, so all the baked goods go out the door. And it's just a way to recognize that, you know, we, we want to live without sin in our lives. 
So the entire lamb then, and this is why they had to figure out how many people, the entire lamb had to be eaten that morning mm. or that evening. I mean, there was, so there would be nothing left at the end. Now, I'm going to read a little more scripture, then we're going to talk. So in Exodus 12, verse 11, we read, And thus you shall eat it, and you had to eat it a certain way, and this is how. With a belt on your waist, with your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For, and this is what God says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and the firstborn in the land of Egypt. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, God said, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and, ye, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. So this is why this is the oldest religious rite still in practice today, thousands of years already. He says, and you shall keep the feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. In other words, this was never going to be forgotten mm -hmm. in the history of the world. And I suspect mm -hmm. this will never be forgotten in all of eternity as well. So the Passover reminds us that freedom comes with a price. Mm -hmm. And we, we always need to never forget that freedom is not free in the sense that it, it costs someone something, okay? Now on that night, you can imagine as, as the, the death angel was moving um, through the land of Goshen, throughout all the land of Egypt, the Israelites could hear screaming as the firstborn were being killed literally in, in their homes. I mean, how terrifying would that be? And, and I would venture to guess that there were probably some Israelites that, that didn't obey Moses mm -hmm. because we knew there were some that were rebellious in the wilderness. So I'm just thinking there probably were, and those homes were visited by death that night. Um, somebody died that evening. But when the death angel saw the blood on your home, he literally would pass over it, and that's where this feast gets its name. The name in Hebrew is Pesach. And Pesach literally means to skip over or jump over. Mm -hmm. So again, when that death angel saw the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, it would pass over that home and leave it alone. If the entrance to your home was not covered with the blood, then the death angel would rush in and the destroyer would visit your family. And it was, it was terrible. It was a terrible thing. Now, after the temple was built, like Solomon built the temple and then Herod rebuilt the temple, people began to bring their lambs there to be sacrificed because mm -hmm. now they were settled in the land. And in the Exodus, God said, the place that I put my name is where you're going to celebrate this feast. Now, there are, there's three feasts every year that every male Jew had to be in Jerusalem for, and Passover was one of the three feasts. So it was a family pilgrimage. Now, the Levite priests then began raising lambs to buy on their arrival because for some families, they were coming a long distance. Um, Nazareth was like three days walk from Jerusalem and then there were Jews coming from much further so what the the priests began to do <clears throat> was to raise lambs in the vicinity of Jerusalem so that when people came they could purchase lambs and of course for them that became a business unfortunately 
It's very interesting, though, that the lambs were raised right outside of Bethlehem. In fact, Bethlehem was known for several things. One of them was the lambs that were raised. And of course, when we read the Christmas story mm -hmm. about the birth of Jesus, yeah. we find out that the shepherds were out in their fields, tending their flocks. Those hills all around Bethlehem, which is not far from Jerusalem, were, were covered with flocks, the, these special sacrificial wow. um, sheep. The other wow. thing that Bethlehem is known for was the, the incredible wheat. They had mm -hmm. great wheat. Wow. It just grew there, and it, it was really, really high-quality wheat. Mm -hmm. So that was the wheat that was used in the temple sacrifices. Mm -hmm. wow. That's why Bethlehem in Hebrew means Bethlehem, or house of bread. Mm -hmm. And of course, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Bethlehem. And of course, he is the bread, bread of life, right? So Jesus is always being identified with all of this, these symbols and these terms, because these feasts are, they're appointments for God. They're appointments for God to meet with us and his people. Mm -hmm. And he says, I want you to be in, in Jerusalem doing these things in my temple at this time. And when you do this, all of these things are going to be pointing to Messiah. They're all going to be pointing to who he is and what he would do and actually when he would do it. Mm -hmm. So, for 1,500 years, Jewish people were doing all these rituals, okay? And the whole basis for the Old Testament was the covering of sin. This is why they brought lambs, so that the blood could be shed, so that their sins would be covered for another year. Mm -hmm. And they did this annually, of course. The thing we know about the, the blood of lambs and, and bulls and goats mm -hmm. and everything is that it's insufficient to take away sin. Mm -hmm. It's only sufficient to cover sin. Or a better way to think of it, think of it would be to like absorb sin. So picture on your countertop in your kitchen, um, let's say you spilled some um, <clears throat> grape juice. If you take a paper towel or two paper towels, tear it off and put it on the countertop, when you see that, that juice being soaked up into the paper towel, Think about that's how the lambs absorb sin. The, the sin was transferred onto them because their blood was shed. So that's the historical background for Passover. That's, that's how we got it. And again, um, to this day, tonight even, it's, it's being celebrated all over the world. Now let's talk about the second thing, about in terms of what the Passover is to the Messiah or, or Jesus. So all throughout scripture, God talked about a lamb that would come and not just a lamb, but the lamb. And the lamb is the centerpiece of history, really, just like it's the centerpiece of the table tonight for Passover. The thing about the coming of this lamb would be he would take away sin once and for all. Mm -hmm. It would be in the ultimate sacrifice that wouldn't just cover sin for a year but it would eradicate it or take it away so the passover meal reminds us that there's an exchange it's the innocent mm. for the guilty wow. and as people are eating that that is something that needs to kind of be at the forefront of our thinking that it, it was the the innocent for the guilty Again, there's a price for freedom, and somebody is paying for this, okay? Now, 700 years before Jesus was, was even born, one of Israel's hardest-hitting prophets was the prophet Isaiah. Mm -hmm. And the prophet Isaiah, <coughs> by the, the, really the vision and power of the Holy Spirit, looked forward in time to see the coming of the Lamb of God, the Messiah. And in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 through 8, and I'm going to have Michelle go ahead and read that. 
because this is what Isaiah saw in terms of the sacrifice of the Lamb. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked away. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, and he was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before its shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away, and no one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. Mm. So what, what Isaiah saw in the spiritual realm, John the Baptist saw in the natural realm, okay? What Isaiah saw as the future, John the Baptist saw as in the present. And if you want to turn with me to John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, this is John the Baptist, and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now John could have only known that by the Spirit of God, okay? John the Baptist then instructs his disciples and all of us to embrace the Lamb. Mm -hmm. Moses told us to embrace the Lamb. Now John the Baptist is telling us to embrace the Lamb. Three and a half years after that happened, Jesus enters Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. Mm -hmm. Palm Sunday is the 10th of Nisan. And for the next five days, the lamb was inspected. Hmm. He was inspected. And God made sure that everybody knew that this was the sinless Son of God. In fact, in Luke, if you want to turn, go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 20, verse 26. The religious leaders were all asking these questions, trying to trap him. It says, so they failed to trap him by what he said in front of the people instead they were amazed by his answers and they became silent verse 39 then says well said teacher remarks some of the teachers of religious law who were standing there and then no one dared to ask him any more questions mm -hmm. so the religious leaders literally couldn't find fault with him and we know they had to falsely accuse him to eventually bring him to trial mm -hmm. but it's interesting even in they, they found false guilt on him in his religious trial, but then in the civil trial, the civil authorities couldn't find fault with him either. Hmm. We go on to read in Luke 23, verses 3 through 4, So Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, You have said it. And Pilate, turning to the leading priests and to the crowd, said, I find nothing wrong with this man. Hmm. See, they couldn't find any fault in him because he was the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. He was fully God. He was fully man. But he had no sin. And it had to be that way because he was born to die as the Passover Lamb. Mm -hmm. Now, the Apostle Paul made the connection. And in order to fill, fulfill Scripture... Christ had to die. He knew that. 
That was his purpose in life. He came literally to die. Paul told the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he calls this Christ. He says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So let us celebrate the festival, not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. Now it's interesting, he's writing to a church in Greece. He's writing to a, a church that's made up of some Jewish people and then a lot of people that were not Jewish that converted to belief in the Messiah or Jesus. Wow. And so that gives us basis for recognizing that these feasts are an everlasting ordinance. There's something very, very important about them. Peter also made the connection with Jesus being the Lamb of God. He says this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. He says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with merely gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he is being re revealed for your sake. So when you read that the, the Lamb of God who was chosen to die even before the foundations of the earth, it was always in the mind of God to have the Lamb as the centerpiece of history, wow. the Messiah. Now, in a Jewish Passover tonight in the homes, there's four cups that are being celebrated. And what they do is throughout, throughout the evening, um, there's different cups that are recognized for different parts of the meal. And of course, you know, usually, you know, they're, they're pretty full. This is, this is grape juice, and uh, we're gonna be having communion, which is really identifying with the Passover meal a little bit later. So the first cup in the Passover meal is called the cup of sanctification, mm. okay? And sanctification means being set apart, okay? Set apart for a holy, purpose. It's the cup of separation mm -hmm. is what it's known as. And what God says in Exodus 6, and you can look this up later, is he's saying, I will bring them out of Egypt. That was God's promise. And he said, I will bring you out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And in our church, we identify that with knowing God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Making that connection that it's not about religion. It's really about a relationship with God. So we're, we're to know God. And once we do that, God is calling us out of the world or out of Egypt, because Egypt is connected and synonymous with the world in Scripture. He calls us out of the world yeah. into his family yeah. and into his kingdom. Mm -hmm. So he's calling us out. So as the um, meal progresses, there's the second cup. And so they pick up another cup of wine. And they drink this, and this is called the cup of deliverance, okay? It's the cup of being set free. So what it is is God got them out of Egypt. Now he's got to get Egypt out of them, right. okay? And really, in, in our circles and in our church, that we call that finding freedom in life. Mm -hmm. So we come into a relationship with God to know him, and then as we get set apart for God and, and we lay worthless things aside, we begin to find freedom in life. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody, we're, we're all in, in a lot of ways during this season, we're, we're in our homes. And we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But it's interesting, the things that we've kind of laid aside. Um, I, was, I was telling Michelle the other day, uh, we, were, we were talking and we are like, Man, we're saving a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, we're we're not eating out hardly. I mean, we're all the money that we always set aside every week. That that's that's just staying in the bank. Mm -hmm. You know, the the gas that we would normally spend driving all over the place. Mm -hmm. Now, gas prices it it's a, a buck thirty yeah. for gas right now, right? right? You know, so it would be cheap. But <laughs> we're just not driving around. I was looking at my tank going into the office today and. You know, I've only used just a little bit because I filled it up. And I thought, right. wow. So 
it's interesting. We're all kind of being, um, for our safety, just being asked to stay at home mm -hmm. and just stay safer at home. If you live in our state, it's called different things, different other right. places, but um, it's it's really true. And I totally lost what I was talking about. Oh yeah, <laughs> the I was, second cup. yeah, I was talking about the second cup. After two or three cups of wine, you start, you know, no, we're not going there. Okay, so the the third cup yes, in the meal. Let's talk about the third cup. All right, here we go. The third cup was called the cup of redemption. Mm. And it's very interesting. The cup of redemption was special because to redeem something means to buy back or purchase it. And then it's got even a deeper meaning. And what it means is to be returned to its original intent. Yeah. And the third cup of redemption is the cup that Jesus picked up after the meal that yeah. that when he he identifies that with his blood wow. that we're going to look at in just a bit yeah. that was the third cup of redemption incidentally a, a lot of you um, probably know that that I wear this ring on my hand and and um, I'll, I'll just tell you a quick backstory on this ring so um, years ago um, I was going through a really really difficult time in life it, it was just it was just one of those um, crushing seasons mm -hmm. where a lot of things, God was just allowing circumstances, and we, we all go through that, right. where things were just getting pressed, um, pressed out of my life, and, 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 and just there was just a lot of pressure. And I was, I was in Israel um, kind of towards the end of that season, and I know a jewelry maker... Um, whose family has lived in the old city for generations. Um, if you come there with me uh, to Israel, um, we'll go there because he, he makes custom jewelry, very high quality, but at a very good price. And he makes um, Christian jewelry. He makes um, Jewish jewelry. I mean, he'll, he'll do Muslim. He's an Arab, okay? So I asked him to make this ring for me um, because there was a, a scripture out of Job that was really meaningful to me at that time mm. and what I asked them to do and, and you you really can't see this well maybe you can <laughs> all the way around here it's there's a he it's written in Hebrew and on it it says in Hebrew Ani yadati go lichai. and what that means is I know that my Redeemer lives and every morning when, when I, I put this ring on, I think about the fact that God has redeemed my life. He redeemed me out of that season. And that everything that I touch can be redeemed by God. That's awesome. No matter how bad it is, no matter how difficult. I want to encourage you, if you're going through a very, very difficult time in a season right now, and this time is a season of it's suffering right now. A lot of people are suffering and hurting. Our world is hurting. Um, maybe just you're, you're battling with depression right now because you have to be at home. And if you're an extrovert, it's, it's challenging because we're not around a lot of people. But God wants to redeem it. He wants to make something beautiful out of it. Yes. And, and he wants to just bring us back to that place of knowing that whatever he touches, he can change for good. What the enemy has meant for harm, God wants to turn it around yes. for good. Absolutely. So... Um, shoot some hearts up, do some likes if that, <laughs> if that ministers to you. Just just kind of just kind of let us know. Even an amen. Even an amen. Yeah, you got an amen. Are you guys still out there? Or? Okay. There's all right, there. there's some. Okay, all right. Woo! <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. All right. So we've got the cup of sanctification, the cup of deliverance, the cup of redemption, and then there's the cup of praise. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's um, out of Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. Uh, God says, I will claim you as my own people, and I will be your God. Now, that, that cup of praise is the Hallel. Right. Okay. And after four cups, everyone's happy, yeah. right? Lots of Hallels. Lots of Hallels. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, tonight, again, the Jewish people are, are going to be going through each of these four cups. Yes. Now, there is a there's a fifth cup that 
not a lot of people really think about or talk about. And that fifth cup was debated by the rabbis as to what should be done with that cup. Mm. Do we include it in the Passover meal? What place does it have? Uh, and there was this heated debate, should we or, or shouldn't we? Um, today, if you go to a Passover meal, there's an, there's an empty cup. Mm -hmm. There's a cup sitting on the table in a place setting. They call it the cup of Elijah because they said, when Elijah shows up, he's going to explain what it is. Hmm. That's when they just, you know, we'll, we'll just kind of sweep this one until we kind of figure this out. But what that, what that fifth cup is, was known as the cup of God's wrath. Hmm. It, it was the cup, cup of God's suffering. In fact, in Jeremiah 25, God hands Jeremiah a cup and he says, take this to the nations, all of them are going to be drinking out of it. Wow. It was the cup of God's anger. It was the cup of God's wrath. It, it was his fury. Imagine a holy God falling into the hands of a furious, angry God. Mm. God is angry about the sin in the world. And what's amazing about this is that God knew that that cup ha had to be emptied. Mm. It had to be drunk. It had to be drained. So... Jesus and his disciples, they celebrate the Passover. The first, second, third cup where he identif identifies it with himself. The fourth cup of the Hallel. Mm -hmm. Then they leave and they go up to the Mount of Olives after the Passover meal. I heard Ray Vanderlaan say this recently, and I'd, I'd never thought about this. Running in between the temple in Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives is the Kidron Valley. Mm. And in the rainy season in April, during the rain, all of the blood of the sacrifices were being washed and running through that valley. So Jesus and his disciples literally had to walk through wet, bloody mud on their way to get up to what we know as the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm. The Bible never really says it's a garden. We associate it because there's, there's two descriptions. It's a cultivated area, but then it also says that it was, a it was an olive press there. And in fact, that's what, when, when you hear the term Gethsemane, you have to understand it's two words in Hebrew, Gat Shemunim. Gat is the press, the weight, and the Shemunim is, is the, the olive oil. And so there was this place where Jesus went to pray where there was this olive press. It was a place of crushing. Okay? And of course, we read in Matthew 26 that on this night, it says, Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gat Shemunim, or Gethsemane, and he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. So the Gospels tell us he went about a, a stone's throw away. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John. And then it says Jesus became anguished and distressed. And he told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. I believe as the Son of Man and the Son of God, Jesus knew exactly in the minutest detail what he was about to face that night and the next day. And so he says to them, stay here and keep watch with me. Mm -hmm. Now this night, the night of Passover, is called the night of keeping watch. Really? It's it's because we're watching for what's what's wow. going to happen. And so on this night Jesus said to his disciples, "Keep watch with me." 
that meant something to them and it needs to mean something right. to you and I that, that we keep watch for the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 39 says, He went a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father. And I believe he was, he was crying out, it says in the book of Hebrews, in tears and in anguish. He says, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering wow. be taken away from me. It was, this, it was this fifth cup. Wow. It was the cup of God's wrath against sin. It was the cup of God's fury and anger and punishment of sin. And then Jesus said, Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Or as some translations say, Not my will, but your will be done. Right. Jesus knew that he was going to be drinking the cup of wrath, God's wrath that was brimming over, he knew what that meant for him. It was what, Michelle, you read earlier, that he was going to be bruised and crushed and beaten and, and tortured to death right. for our sins. He was going to pay that penalty and that God's wrath literally was going to be placed on him to the point where on the cross, Jesus cries out, quoting Psalm 22, he, he cries out to God, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was feeling the full measure of the fury of God, the anger of God, the, the wrath of God punishing sin so that God had to turn away. He could no longer even look on his son. And for the first time in history, God felt the separation of sin. Jesus felt that as a, as a man, fully man, the separation of sin as he cried out and suffered. And when he finished his life, it's recorded in the Gospels, he cried out with a loud voice. He said, it is finished. He had drank the cup Mm -hmm. to the until it was empty mm -hmm. the wrath of God it, he emptied the cup for us the terrible furious wrath of God was completely satisfied in the Lamb of God mm -hmm. he completely took away the sin of the world and he was saying it's finished Father I've, I've drank all of your wrath I've taken upon myself all of the sin of the world all of the sin that you and I have committed that we will ever commit he took it upon himself and then he said it is finished and then he said as the sacrifice and this is sacrificial language mm -hmm. it's actually the language of first fruits father into your hands I commend my spirit. He put his, his spirit in the hands of his spiritual authority, his father. He commended himself, and then he says he gave up his life. And he died for us. And he completely satisfied the penalty for sin. When we say Jesus paid for our sins, we have to understand that freedom came at a terrible price. It, it came at the expense of, of the life of Jesus. As, as a 33-year-old man, at the height of his health and strength, taking upon himself the disease, the sickness, the, the wickedness, the, 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 just the, all the horror that is associated with sin, he took it all upon himself. And it says he was disfigured so much that he was barely recognizable as a man, Isaiah says. So Jesus completely forever paid for our sins for those of us that have received that sacrifice.
in just a few minutes, we're going to have communion together, which is part of that Passover meal. And I see it's it's getting it's starting to get dark outside. Um, the moon is is beginning to rise out there. I wanted to just share some things, and Michelle, please interject. Um, so, what what does this Passover in 2020 mean to us? I personally believe that there are a lot of prophetic <laughs> overtones mm -hmm. to what is happening um, in in this year. Um, first and foremost, God knew um, that this year would be like this. Right. Um, he knew he knew what COVID nineteen was before it was ever named. Right. He understood that it, it was it was going to be unleashed into the world, and he knew that there would be suffering. Uh, associated with it. The thing we have to understand is that what the enemy means for harm, God always turns around for good. Remember, he, he redeems everything. And that's that's a silver lining, yeah. I, I think, in all of this. And um, there, there have been prophetic voices in the body of Christ, and there are some trusted prophetic voices. Um, one of them is Dutch Sheets. Mm -hmm. You may have heard that name. He's an intercessor. Um, he's written a lot of great books. Um, he's got a, a great ministry that I think is very balanced in this area. And um, one of the things that Dutch Sheets will tell you and that I've shared with you as well is that all of history is really framed by harvest times. The feasts are framed by times mm -hmm. of harvest. Um, it, it's very important to God prophetically the harvest of um, different periods in history including the ones that are ahead um, I really believe that the, tonight is it's really marking something happening there there is there is a shift mm -hmm. prophetically mm -hmm. um, one one voice that um, I've heard recently kind of said it this way. He said the first four months, January, February, and March, were really a season of repentance. That God knew that this disease was going to cause us, we, we were going to know that the only way to slow down and flatten the curve like we've all heard about is to separate, get back in our homes, and let it be disruptive to our normal lives. Um, I mean, this has been a very disruptive, it's, it's beyond interruption, it's disruption, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, from that standpoint, the disruption breaks the rhythm of life and rest and even work and it's causing people just to sort of examine their lives. And it's caused me to slow down, be praying more, to be right. thinking more about God. Right. Um, I don't know if you want to just share a little bit about kind of what's been happening in this season for you. Um, so for me, I've been really, right from the beginning, you know, God was speaking to me about the Passover. When I heard especially when I heard schools closing, kids going home, you know, I just knew that God was calling us into that season. And obviously the Passover was the first and foremost. So I've, I personally have been just calm, praying, seeking, hearing him. And, you know, as you're sharing about the different cups, I, I think we're going through those different cups and God is teaching us about those cups and you know everywhere I turn everywhere I'm, I'm talking to people you know it's definitely a time of self-examining and I I do believe that you know Jesus is the spotless lamb and he deserves a, a spotless bride and I do believe that when we come out of this um, the church is going to be in, in the place it's supposed to be mm -hmm. and God's going to be using that the church um, but we have to reflect the glory of God. We can't reflect our own glory. 
And that's what the moon does, right? It reflects oh, wow. the glory of the sun. And even in the positioning of where the moon is, it's very important. That's good, Michelle. And so, you know, God, he has his reasons. I think, though, a lot of this generation, mine included, have not seen the side of the Lord. Mm. And the thing is to remember that he, he is love is everlasting, you know, and it's important to dig into the word mm. and keep reminding ourselves who he really, who he is. And remembering that this is, he, he loves, he wants his children, but he had to just stop his children, you know. And so um, I even find it interesting. I mean, there's just no coincidence, you guys. Like, you know, yesterday was, was the 7th of April. In the Bible, 7 represents completion. Um, today, it fell on the 8th. 8th represents new beginnings. Mm. And so I think what we're hearing about prophetically with the shifting, I think that's part of it is because we're, we're in a new beginnings. And, um, but we've got to make sure that we don't go back. I mean, I personally have gone through so much with the Lord, and I don't know if he's finished with me yet, but it's like, mm. man, I do not want to go back. <laughs> this was way too difficult I want to just keep pressing forward and, and keep, you know, I want to get on that other side and see the signs, wonders, and miracles and see the glory of God. And, you know, I, I want to see our phones being used to, to record uh, miracles happening rather than injustice happening. I want to yes. see the glory of the Lord coming through the media. Don't you guys? Hey, can I interject? Jackie Falks um, just posted something. It was this young woman. <laughs> Yeah. Who prayed for this man's wife in Sam's Club. Uh, she had slumped over and she was gone. And this young woman in her car, I mean, I, I was just, I so enjoyed watching that yesterday, just was praising God because she prayed and asked the Lord to spare this woman's life. And this woman, she came back. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it, it's an amazing, amazing testimony. Right, right. Yeah. So, Listen, you guys, I, I really believe this. I believe right now God is, is watching the nations. He's, he's watching the nations of the earth. And, and he's, he's watching us as individuals, but on a granular level, you know, individual by individual, house by house. But he's also watching the nations to see which nations yes. during this time turn back towards him. Yes. And 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 call out to him and and humble themselves. There's going to be sheep nations and goat nations. Yeah. And that's where our prayers come in for our nation. We want to be a sheep nation. Yeah. I right now, I mean <clears throat> One of the reasons I wanted to connect uh, as a church to um, Unite714.com, which is out of Second Chronicles 714, mm. I wanted to do that because the basis of that prayer in Second Chronicles 714 is, is not just anybody. It's, he says, if my people right. will humble themselves right. as, as believers, as those who have a relationship with God, if we humble ourselves mm -hmm. and turn towards him and confess our sins, He's going to hear from heaven. He's going to forgive our sin and, yeah. and heal our land. And um, God is watching the nations right now. And I'm telling you, mark my words, that in the months going coming out of this season of repentance, um, the nations that are turning towards God are going to see the glory of God. And the nations that are hardening and turning away from God yeah. aren't going to see it. Right. And so this, this first four months are really, I believe... Uh, a season of repentance I think the next four months coming out of this May June July and August are going to be a, a, a season of recovery mm -hmm. and that God is going to be speaking to people and he's going to help us begin to recover I, I don't think we're just going to get the green light all clear boom everything's back to normal mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a ramp up personally um, so in this recovery time I I just think that America, and I, I shared this 
uh, and I'll, I'll tell everybody here, I, I'm, I'm part of a, um, a round table through our chamber. And I, I just, I share this with, with uh, these CEOs, um, these executives, these men and women. I just said, you know, our, our nation has just gotten so far off the rails morally. I mean, we, we are, honestly, we're just so far out in left field. And I mean, what, what hit me was in January when the governor of New York um, signed into law, everyone's smiling, right. the fact that, well, now, now we can kill our children indiscriminately. Right. And I just think something broke in the spiritual realm. Yeah. And I believe just like that was, that was, the, that was a tipping point yeah. and God knew it. And, and I, I went, I got on Facebook, I commented that morning. I was like, Lord, help us yeah. in this season. Our nation has just gotten so off. And I mean, this is a massive reset right now. Right. I really, really believe that. Right. And so as we're, we're going to come out of this, this recovery, I, I believe that as we repent by August, it, America will begin to get our voice back. Mm -hmm. I think God wants us to get back on the moral high ground. Yeah. I think he wants to make our nation and our churches and our communities, our cities, sh uh, shining examples on a hill mm -hmm. for all the nations. Mm -hmm so that we can get the gospel out so that people can come into a relationship with Christ so that so that people can hear that look you don't have to wallow in sin there's a remedy for sin and it's Jesus Christ so I really believe that that's what going into this the late spring and, and summer and, and late summer is really going to be all about recovery and it I think it's going to slowly come back it's not going to be an all at once thing I think everything's just going to just move back but not towards normal i think there's going to be a new normal right in a lot of ways somebody i heard somebody call this it what's going to happen is called the uncomfortable revival right and again prophetic voices have talked about the glory of god being seen in ways like we've never seen it before and then the last four months of the year september october november december which, which is very interesting prophetically because September marks the beginning of the next round of feasts, if you will, okay? Um, Rosh Hashanah is the, the head of the new year. It's, it's the Feast of Trumpets. That begins a brand new harvest cycle. Again, somebody said this could be the beginning of the Third Great Awakening all around the world, that, that God's glory would just be seen in, in an incredible way. And so we would go from repentance now to a recovery period and then into recompense that's what's being said this idea that that god is more he's gonna more than redeem it, it i mean it, it is it'll be beyond our wildest imagination and so i think that this this passover is really a turning point in history yeah. and that god is realigning nations and that America, for our nation, because that's who we're responsible for, is really going to get take our proper place again. Right. I really believe that. Right. And and I want to say this: um, the the greatest the greatest era in in church history is not behind us. The greatest era in church history is in front of us. Right. I honestly, honestly believe that. So, what I'd like you to do is. Um, Let's, let's all get our uh, communion elements together, yeah. and we're going to finish out by having communion together. And, um, okay, Michelle, okay, <laughs> okay. Are we, are we, like, we only got so many minutes? How many minutes did we buy? I don't know, but... No, isn't this free? I'm sure everybody wants to keep moving on with tonight. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, what I'd like you to do is just go ahead and, and uh, get the communion elements out, if you would, please. And um, I'm reading out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, and again, Paul is writing this out of the context of Passover, because that's, that's what we're really celebrating here. Mm -hmm. 
And he said, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night that he, Jesus, was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. So I'd like you to go ahead and um, take whatever you're using um, for the bread. And we're going to give thanks together. And uh, for those of you that are part of our congregation, you know it's our tradition to pray the prayer that Jesus prayed on that night. So I'd just like you to hold this piece of bread up, and we're going to give thanks for it. And I'd like you to agree with me in your heart. Baruch atah Adonai Elienu, Melech HaOlam, Mamoitzi HaLechem Min HaAretz, which means, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Jesus said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. Father, we thank you that Jesus is the bread of life. He's the bread that came down from heaven. He is the Lamb of God that was sacrificed for the sins of the world. Father, all over the world, Jewish homes are gathered around this meal tonight. We pray that the eyes of their understanding would be open tonight, that you would remove that veil yes, Lord. and cause them to understand yes. that Jesus is the Passover lamb. He is the bread of life Jesus. and that this represents his broken body. Yes. Lord, we receive this in remembrance of what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat it together. We read in the same way he took the cup of wine after supper, so this is the third cup of redemption. And he gave thanks for it. And I'd just like you to hold this up. And someday I will teach you about the Jewish marriage customs, because what we are doing right now is very significant as well. It has more than just this meaning. But I'd like you to just agree with you, with me in your hearts as we give thanks for this in the same way that Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Baruch atah Adonai Elienu, Melech HaOlam, Barei Pri HaGofen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the vine. Jesus, we are the fruit of your life. You are the vine and we're just the branches and the fruit that we bear is because of your life-giving presence yes. flowing through us. Jesus, you said this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us drink together. Well, everybody, this is as close as we can get to being together. And Michelle and I really miss you. I'm sorry. We really, really miss you guys. We don't only miss the people in our congregation, we miss the people that are in different states that are hopefully watching or are gonna watch this. Goods and family, we love you. We, just all the people that we know around the country, around the world, we just yeah. miss just being with you. And we, we love you very, very much. Um, it's, it's just providentially 
Tonight is Passover. Next Wednesday it ends, but right in the middle of this is Sunday. <laughs> yes. We are going to <laughs> celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes. And I mean, we're going to celebrate on Sunday. Um, I'm encouraging you, um, 10 a.m., we're going to be live streaming our hearts out. <laughs> Look at all the hearts going on. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the worship team, they are so excited. Yeah, they're ready about, to go. They're ready to go. Um, we're, we're ready, and um, we're going to be just celebrating the fact. You know, Friday came, and that was a dark day. But then Sunday came, right, and that, right. that made it all, made it worth it, and makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you guys, um, until we can really be together, you know, physically, right. please know that we're, we're together spiritually. And I want to encourage you guys, too. We've got that one page for just like a bulletin board. Yes. So I really want to encourage you guys to do something special. Make some new traditions this week. This is Holy Week. Hey. And and everybody's got some traditions, but let's really do it. And then take pictures, record yourself, post it. We all want to share in on this together because we're still family, right? We're still together that way. Hey, can we do this? I'm going to do this on Sunday. I'm, I'm going to get suited and booted uh -huh. <laughs> for Sunday. Um, it would be great if you guys as, a, as uh, individuals or as a couples or as a family, you guys want to dress up and uh, worship with us, take a picture of yourselves, post it on the Facebook page. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be looking for the, the thread on uh, Sunday of all the people watching. Hey, and then I want to share this with you um, too. The week after um, this Sunday, we're, we're starting a brand, a brand new series uh, this Sunday that it's going to be um, What Just Happened. That's, that's the name of this series. And, and this was this was chosen last December when we got um, our my mentoring team together. Uh, this is what we wanted to call us. We had no idea all this was going to be going on during Easter time, yeah. but it's called What Just Happened. The week after Sunday, okay, I think that'd be the 19th. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to just be preaching a little shorter, and then you guys can uh, bring your questions. And bring them up on the thread and we're gonna yeah. be taking a few minutes and and I'm gonna just answer questions just on the spot nice. um, things that maybe you want to know about the the message or questions you have so um, just kind of be prepared for that that'll be the week after Easter and I think it'll be great so um, you guys we can't wait to see you on Sunday um, t seriously take t I'll, you'll get to see me but I won't get to see you all so take some pictures Post them on Facebook, and that's another way that we're going to be able to stay right, together. Right, And remember, Hag Sameach. Hag Sameach. <laughs> okay, you guys. Hey, we love you. God bless you. Have a great Passover, and uh, we will see you on Sunday. Yes. Thanks so much. Worthy is the Lamb. Yes.